welcome to the first Metro Home Theater Home Tech Tips episode. As I'm sure you've noticed, we are running a little bit behind schedule. Apparently, there was a Facebook collapse just before we started. But here we are on YouTube live. Let me introduce you to what's going on here today. Along with me is Adam Rogers, one of our tech support guys. Hey, everybody. Say hi, Adam. How's it going? And, of course, you guys know Brent McCall, of course, the one and only. What we're going to do with each of these segments, which is going to be bi-weekly, and please join us, is go over some of the issues, concerns, and what's happening out there for the custom installers, go over some new products that are ours, hopefully get some interviews with other people in the industry, and our final episode of the day will be, each show, an unboxing. Now, in the unboxing, we go through one of our products, what's in it, what it does, and how you use it, and the viewer with the best question between now and midnight, midnight tonight. will win that product, so please watch good questions so we're going to start with a little bit of background on who we are who metro is and what's going on now at this point most of you guys know me you've been to cedia you've seen me at presentations you've heard me speak probably with earplugs in and you know that i've been in this industry one way or another since 1977 so i've seen a lot of changes a lot of things have grown up we've all gotten a little bit older some of us more so than others and it's still a lot of fun but with me is Adam Rogers, our newest addition to the Metro Tech team. He comes straight from the field and has a little bit different approach than I do at this point in my life. So tell me a little bit about yourself, Adam. So I've been in the industry now for going on about five years um, since I first started. Um, I'm currently a Control 4 certified technician. Um, I'm working here, of course, with Metro on the tech support team. Um, and, of course, I'm one of the guys who answers the phones when you guys call in. Um, so... You will also notice him from a lot of the new videos with the smooth FM radio voice. Hi, this is Adam Rogers. That's right. He is a very smart individual, a little on the short side, as you can see. <laughs> Either that or I fooled him with his chair. But he is very helpful, and particularly on the spy clops and networking questions, can be a big boon to you guys. So if you have any needs, any wants, give him a holler, and you guys know you can always reach me on my cell phone at 386 eight four six seven two six four from eight a.m. to ten p.m. seven days a week and after today all that will be on a splash screen I forgot to do that so I'm sorry so today Brent um, of course everyone knows what the uh, you see the the title for the for the video for today now of course what we're gonna be talking about is the biggest change between HDMI 2.0 and HDMI 2.1 so um, we pulled together a, kind of a, the top three things to talk about today uh, for, the, uh, for the changes. Well, he pulled together the top three things to talk about today, and he's going to surprise me with them to see how good I am. Yes. So um, we'll just jump right in. So our first question or our first big title thing to talk about is but the difference between HDMI 2.0 and 2.1 is what's happening with the fourth channel. Well, let's... Step back a second. Let's talk about the similarities between HDMI 2.0 or 1.4 or 1.3 or 1.2 and 1.1 and HDMI 2.1. Those similarities are the terminal and HDMI. That is pretty much the end of the similarities. From there, it's a complete diversion over what we've done in the past. Um, supposedly, Adam has created some graphics for me. So... Of course, you've got HDMI 2.0. Can um, you guys, is this visible? Yeah. There we go. So with HDMI 2.0, of course, you've got the three channels. Um, you've got D0, D1, D2, uh, D2, and then, of course, D3 is your clock, which is your fourth channel. So and the thing to know is from the very beginning, all four of these channels have been in every HDMI iteration. And in theory, all four of these channels have been equal in design on both the circuits, the electronics, and the cables. In theory since the very beginning. However, since the very beginning, D3, the clock channel, has only needed to be about one-tenth of the same bandwidth as the video channels. Consequently, many manufacturers, both in hardware and cable, have taken a lot of shortcuts to cut cost. This is where we're seeing the change as we go forward into 2.1. Because as we step into 2.1, next slide, please, sir. You will see the big change is the fourth channel, D3, now becomes a full bandwidth channel. Where in the past, D0, D1, and D2 represented red, green, and blue, and D3 was just the clock. Now, 
all three channels are aggregate of color and clock. This allows the system to easily adapt to changes in sources and display. So if there's not enough bandwidth available from the display or capability or from the cable, they can back it down to match what the system can do. In the past, with the old version, this was not possible. So this is a big step forward in compatibility, but it's also a big step backwards in reliability for jobs that already exist. Um, can you go back to the previous slide, sir? So if you have a cable like this, and this is 90% of them out there, you're not going to get the full capabilities of what HDMI 2.1 can do for you. Only the first three channels are going to give you all the bandwidth. Would you go forward again, sir? Yep. With this one, all four channels are equal. Now, right now, that means six gigabits per channel for a total of 24. This is the initial step into HDMI 2.1. This will give you 8K, it will give you 4K 60, it will give you 4K 120, it will give you um, 444 capability, and it will also give you some expanded color depths as we get closer to BT 2020. Down the road, this will go from 6 gigs per channel to 12 gigs per channel. Now, it is our understanding, our understanding, that there will be some slight terminal changes not in what you physically see or the shape, but how it's built inside, similar to when they went from Cat 5 to Cat 6 and the RJ45. So it's still fully compatible physically, but the new terminal will offer a greater bandwidth. Sadly, at this point, we do not have any documentation, engineering data, white sheets, or anything else on this. What makes it worse is right now there's not even a CTS for testing this. So... Anybody that's claiming to have a 2.1 cable or 48 gig cable, for example, really doesn't know what they're talking about because there's not a test to validate that. And we're already seeing ads, 2.1 ultra cables. Guys are not real because there's not a way to test. There's no equalization that's known. There's no capabilities on the new terminal designs. We don't know what's happening. So, Brent, what are they doing when they say, when they ask something, or pardon me, when they're, mar when they're merchandising the fact that they have 24 gigabits per second. Well, 24 gigabits per second is a valid, testable statement. When you look at, for example, our VLOX Passive, our VLOX Active T-Series, our MHX cables up to 7.5 meters, our MHY cables up to 15 meters, all of those cables have been resubmitted to DPL to validate 6 gigs per channel by 4 channels. So we know that the cables are absolutely capable of that. So you can put those in, move forward into your jobs, and feel comfortable that certainly in the early days of HDMI 2.1, which, let's be honest, is probably five years on the short side, you are good to go. When you look at our products like the GA1, the GA2, the uh, Junior Plus, the um, AIO, the SP2, the VCT, all of these were designed from the very beginning with four equivalent channels. Actually, my very first product we ever built, the Dad, will do this even now, and it's a 12-year-old product. It's not that we knew we were going here. We just built the best product we could at the time, and it turns out it gives us a full six gigs per channel by four. So, Brent, that actually kind of rolls us into uh, point number two, of course, would be that fourth channel bandwidth inside of the electronics. Yes. Now, this is where you're going to see a lot of problems. When you, wow, when you look at HD base T, the extenders, the switches, the vast majority of these products only offer three channels of full bandwidth, unless it is listed as a 2.1 chipset, like some of the new televisions. We are still, in the next year to 18 months, seeing a rollout in these devices. So it's going to take a bit of time to get the full bandwidth capability in place, but you do want to start putting the wires, the fiber, and the copper in now to make this transition, because once it starts shipping, your clients are going to expect the full capabilities that are going to be out there with streaming as we move to higher bandwidth streaming, with hard content, and there is discussion of hard content at 8K. So you're going to need to be able to prepare for this, whether it's Kaleidoscape or other download services, Amazon or Netflix. You need to be prepared for where this is going now. So with that in mind, Brent, does that also mean that if I were to have a... Um or if somebody were to have a, a basic HDMI switch or splitter? 
at that point that's running 18 gigs, um, are they going to be able to use it on? Probably not. Because okay. the vast majority of chips that support these devices really are only the first. Would you go back to the previous drawing? Sure can. When you look at switches, matrixes, splitters, extenders, the devices and AVRs and televisions, unless it specifies an HDMI 2.1 chipset in the hardware, it's really going to be this. So the first three channels are the, for the full six gig. That fourth channel is probably not. The other side of it, particularly as you move into extenders and matrixes, is it's not just the bandwidth. The way the data is handled will be differently under the new version than under 2.0, 1.4, 1.3, et cetera. So there are other changes happening. Typically, when you look at a panel or a device that has a 2.1 chipset in it, there's going to be at least two physical HDMI chips, an HDMI 2.0 chip and an HDMI 2.1 chip. Is that how it is now when you go between a 1.4 and a 2.0 Typically, chip yes, it is. Now, there are starting to be some combined chips out there, mm. but particularly when we first started shipping HDMI 2.0 devices and, more importantly, with HDR support, there was physically two chipsets. So you had a 1.4 that handled everything up to and including basic 4K. But once you stepped into deep color and HDR, at that point, you had to move into the full 2.0 chipset. So does that mean, so I'm, I'm assuming then at that point, so the integrators that have been around long enough to know the change between the 1.4 to the 2.0, what they saw during that, that change would be, of course, the fact that, you know, the, the, the biggest thing of, of incompatibility between the different source content and, of course, the displays. Absolutely. Are we going to be seeing something very Absolutely. similar to all of that? Okay. Absolutely. And it's not that anybody wants this to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just going to take a little bit of time for the system to shake itself out and find compatibility between all the devices. Okay. It's not like anybody's waking up one morning and says, hey, I want to make life miserable for these guys. Let's do what we can to, to, to mess with them. So I guess that kind of does lead us back into the final, the number three item of what we were talking about. So now that, of course, you know, Sony is out, Samsung is out with the new 8K displays and everything. Yes. Um, when more and more items begin to show up, let's talk about guys who have a theater system that in place that they want to go ahead and the new 8K projector is out. The distance going from where their rack system is up to the projector what are we looking at for that? Well, when you're looking at distance, for example, assuming, and we're going to make the assumption, mm -hmm. that you have purchased a good cable, mm -hmm. one that is four equivalent channels. The distance that you got from 18 gig will be the same distance you're getting from 24 gig. Now, if you put in a good quality four equivalent channel cable, like the VLOX Passive, you can always add, as you go extended distances, our new GA2, which is a full 48 gig repeater. So you're not limited into distances. Going into fiber will also help you tremendously. At this point, the fiber is really not set up for the four equivalent channels on the extenders. Today, I can't tell you what's going to happen in CD because we honestly don't know. But if you lay in conduit, which is still the safest thing to do, whatever changes happen, you can be fluid with them. If you put in an AOC cable like our install bay or VLOX fiber, if the changes become dramatic enough that the electronics in that cable are no longer valid, that's not a problem. What you can do at that point is cut the terminals off, put an LC on it, put on the updated extender, and you're ready to go for the future. And theoretically, you're talking 48 gigs yes. on, a, on a single fiber cable. Yes, you are. Point. So, so tremendous amount of capabilities. This truly is not a, oh, my God, the world's ending situation. What it is is an opportunity for you to look forward and do a little bit better preparation in your job so you don't get stung. We actually have more of a knowledge, even though we have less of a knowledge, going into 2.1 because of our history dealing with the changes from 1.2 to 1.3 to 1.4 to 2.0, has given us a strong base to prepare for this change. So, yes, things are going to be different. Yes, there's going to be difficulties. But it's not going to be a traumatic effect. There's a lot of options and opportunities going forward. So the main takeaway from all of this really is just making sure that when you are designing a system, even now, as things are changing, uh, from the new 4K to the new 8K setups and everything and getting ready for the 2.1. Um, keep in mind, conduits, you know, having the ability to have the conduit in place makes it to where you can 
future-proof your setup for later. Um, when, uh, or for that matter, if, if you can't run a conduit or if you, you know, the client's not willing to, to go that far with it, run some extra wires. Run some extra category wire. Run some fiber, fiber. wire. Um, fiber. Fiber really is the way that things are going right now uh, from what we're seeing in the market. Um, Copper is certainly not dead no. by any stretch of the imagination. However, fiber does give you greater flexibility and greater distance, mm -hmm. without question. Um, Brandon, have we received any questions yet? I realize it's our first broadcast. Okay, what we're doing now is checking to see if anybody has sent any questions in to us to answer. Do, 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 do. So what we do, can do, do, do while he's do, looking up the do, questions, do, 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 we do, could get into do, doing our do, unboxing. Do 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 do. Okay, so guys, we have a brand new segment in our brand new show called Unboxing with the Boys. Run the promo. Unboxing with the boys. 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 Okay. So, what we're going to do is, every one of our broadcasts, we're going to bring out one of our products that we really like, open it up, go through everything that's in the box, tell you what's in there, how to use it, what to do with it, why to use it, when to use it, and if you come up with the best question of this segment, you will win this product. So, Adam, open it up. Take it away. I can take it away. Okay, guys. So, um, we're really excited about the fact that we now have, you do know the camera's going the other way, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. Anyways. All right, guys. So we have, uh, today we're going to show off our HD base T, uh, 2.0, uh, extender that's got USB on it. Um, and what we're going to be showing off today, of course, is the unboxing for it and showing you what comes, uh, what comes inside of it. So of course you get the box here. We're going to open it up here. And the first thing you'll notice, of course, you get your user manual with it. Uh, please read the manual. Please. From there, you've got your transmitters and ex and receiver. We'll take those out of the plastic. Now, inside the manual, guys, this is not a joke. Please read this, because everything you need to know as far as connectivity, what ports are where, are right there. Nobody ever reads this, and it'd be nice if you did, because it'd make our job simpler. So underneath the plastic case inside of here of course is all the different accoutrements and different pieces for it you've got your power supply it's a standard 12 volt 1 amp power supply bum, bum, bum. we've got the IR products of course you've got the IR receiver and the IR emitter this is a two-way IR system and it does use the 12 volt IR components. So, so what does that mean it's compatible with? So it is compatible with all major uh, um, control systems, including Control 4 and Crestron. Zantec, um, Niles, SpeakerCraft. It is all standard compatibility with two pin for the uh, emitters and a three pin stereo connection for the receivers. So that also means, of course, that you no longer have to take an emitter from your Control 4 system or control system and stick it to the IR receiver. Uh, you guys who have called in that, that we've said sorry, but that's the best way to do it, you don't have to. You can do it this way. You can actually go directly from your, your controller system into the IR system of this and be able to transmit it from there. So why is there a USB cable, Adam? So this system here is, uh, has the ability to extend USB. Um, and so with that, you have the ability to have a mouse and keyboard at your display as well as having the ability to then connect it to whatever device is on the other end. Uh, so then let me ask, can you also send audio or video over this USB? So, no. This is only really strictly used for uh, mouse and keyboard. It can do a little bit of data, um, but, of course, you're looking at USB like 1.0, maybe 2.0 speeds on it. Okay. So, really, it's kind of designed to be used. So, for do not use it for signage purposes. Now, you will note in each of these units, as I find the camera... There are drawings right there on the top that show you all the connection points, the mono mini, the stereo mini. If you have to break out your own wires, what you can do to make it work. So it is very flexible. She's pointing at the camera, guys, It's and I'm just completely lost. <laughs> do you want me to go to that camera? There you go. There we go. So you'll see there are really nifty drawings right there telling you how to use this device. So you don't have to remember the manual, although please, please read the manual. 
So, guys, what we're going to do today also, um, we don't want to just unbox it for you guys. We also want to go ahead and actually show it off to you guys and see how it works. So, of course, we've got our display back here. We've got our rack system back behind me. I've already got a Blu-ray uh, set up and running for it. So, we're just going to simply plug everything in and show you guys how it works. So, I've got my transmitter over on one side and this is also powered on one side you don't have to run uh, power for both sides you can just have it on one side and then it does power over the ethernet cable to the receiver which side so would you recommend we recommend doing it on the on the transmitter side uh, and why as the power then is able to get sent back to the source device um, one thing that we'll get into on another episode is the fact that hdmi power comes from the display not the source, and that's why we want to put the power. It's better to have it at the display side, or sorry, at, at the transmitter side. So what we're going to do from here, I've got my different links. We're going to go ahead and hook up an Ethernet cable here. And here. Now, just to make sure, when you say Ethernet cable, you are not going through an Ethernet switch. Correct, yeah. This does need to be a direct link to it. Um, guys, when you're trying to do something in a house and you're, you're having it go through a punch down, it's best not to do a uh, punch down because what will happen is on the punch down system, it actually creates too much resistance on it. And so what will happen is you will actually lose picture. Uh, if you go to a lower uh, resolution, sometimes that helps, but honestly, not recommended to go through a punch down. And timing errors. Yeah, lots and lots and lots of, lots of problems. So what we'll do is we'll go back over here and we'll finish getting everything set up. So got our HDMI cable while he's getting all this set up I would like to say thank Sony electronics for the 65 inch display they have provided for our lab it is a huge plus that is another thing guys this is our actual lab we are live and th this is where we do our testing we will test everything here uh, and make sure that everything is working the way that it's supposed to. Um, and then, of course, when you guys send back defective items, this is where we test those defective items. Uh, and we'll talk about defects again at, at another time, but, again, they happen, but we'll get to that later. So, Brent, uh, I've got your favorite show. Yes. So what are we looking at? Well, what this is the Rocky Mountain Express 4K HDR DVD. I do encourage you to pick this up off Amazon. It's a tremendous demo material for a couple of reasons. Because when you start this, one of the very first things you'll see is a sepia picture of the old man. Right. Would you start yep. it? And, and the nice HDR. thing about this sepia picture of the old man is it allows you to check for your deep color and HDR. Because if you're not set properly, you will absolutely see banding right in there that is very pronounced. So this also kind of rolls into the, the bandwidth things that we're talking about with HDMI 2.0 to 2.1. Um, when we're talking about banding here in this situation, what are we running into? We're running into uh, a 4K picture. It's running at 4K 30, but we're running at 420. Yes, we are. And But we're not running at a full 12-bit or 10-bit. This is probably closer to an 8-bit when we see a lot of banding. Is that correct? Correct. And here's the reason why. HD base T typically built into it is a 13.65 acceptance chipset. So it will take data up to 13.65, which is 99.999% of the disk you'll ever put into a UHD Blu-ray player. Anything beyond that will have to have an additional step of compression on top of it to take it from 18 to 13.65, and then 13.65 takes it down to 10 because that is the limit of the copper. Right. So there's not much we can do to go beyond that. But the electronics do a lot of work to compress and then rebuild that. So do not panic. An HD base T unit will not look as good as a fiber cable or a copper cable, but it will still give you a fantastic picture. So if we were to go direct direct link, of course, of course, with a direct HDMI, of course, the picture will be better. Much, much better. But your clients are not going to see that as a rule. So you're going to be in great shape. Let it rock. OK, so. We'll go ahead and get the video playing again. Well, that's William Cornelius. Nobody really cares. <laughs> yeah. But when you look across here, what you're going to see is a little bit of banding, just a little that you would not see in a fiber, in a fiber or copper cable. But it's a whole lot better than what you would see under standard non-HD base T extenders. Correct. 
So you get a smoothing of the picture, more colors, more available options for the TV to pick data from. Now, one of the things you don't have to worry about with HD Base T is refresh lag, so your audio and your video will match. Unlike IP systems, this syncs up properly. So that's a great way to go to maintain audio and video together. So guys, that's our uh, HD Base T extender, the HDBT uh, P2UK-70. Um, again, this unit, literally this one here that we have opened up is the one that we're going to be giving away. So that we know works. That we, yep, exactly. So at that point, uh, of course, leave a message for us, leave a comment, leave a question. Um, and Tell we, them how pretty I am. <laughs> the best question, of course, is the winner. Uh, we'll be running this contest through tonight, 12, p uh, 12 midnight Eastern, Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Time. Today, which today is July 3rd. So, and uh, that's that brings in a close to a close our first episode. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. There will be a lot more, and I can only promise it will get better. Hi, this is Brent McCall with Metro Home Theater Group, and with me is Adam Rogers. We're going to go over the questions that came in after our first live podcast, which if any of you saw that was possibly not the greatest performance we've ever done, but we're very proud of it nonetheless. So let's ask the questions. Yep. What do you got? Okay, guys. So first question, question comes in from Symphony Hi-Fi. Um, the first question is, when will 2.1 cables be available? Well, that's quite the uh, loaded question. Yeah, it is uh, a loaded question, and it's one that we argue with every week because, honestly, we don't know. HDMI has not released a timeline on when they're going to give us a CTS, a certified testing standard, to allow us to know, is a cable going to meet the 2.1 specification? However, as mentioned in the podcast, we are already seeing people advertising, we have HDMI 2.1 cables. Yeah. They don't. And, and on top of all of that, there's not really going to be an HDMI 2.1 cable. There's just going to be an HDMI 2.1 source and display, correct? No, there will be a cable. There will be a cable. There is it going to be called anything like, uh, like but I believe Ultra the statement is like Ultra. 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 Ultra is what speed. I believe it's going to be called. Um, currently, HDMI does not allow a product to be called a cable product to be called a number. So from 2.0 actually 1.4 up, you cannot call it a 1.4 or 2.0 cable. It was referred to as standard speed or high speed. It is our understanding that the new nomenclature for cables will be ultra speed. But the standard for testing it has not been released. Well, good question. So Actually, a very good question and one we get a lot of. Yes. So the next question comes in from Greg. Uh, Greg asks, uh, no RS-232 on the uh, free giveaway. There is not. No, there's not. So um, on this unit here, we don't have RS-232. And in fact, I'll have to double check, but I don't believe any of our, ex our current extenders have RS-232. Now, here's the next thing. If this is something you want, tell us, please. Give us a call. Call us here at Tech Support. Call your rep over in sales room. Do whatever you need to do. We need to know what you guys want and what you guys need. I've been in the field recently, in the past six months or so, but I'm back out of the field. I'm here doing tech support calls. Brent, of course, last time he was out, out in the field was a while ago. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Adam. But, uh, <laughs> but to be honest, guys, we need to know what, what you are looking for. We don't get a lot of calls asking for it, but if it's real, we need to know it. Yeah. Um, he also asked, any need for a shielded cat, sick, or cat cable? Um, Your take on this. Okay. So, truthfully, uh, the cables that we tested with to show this, this box off was a Cat 5. I was running just a 60 meter cable. This does say 70 meter, um, but this will run 70 meters with a good termination on a Cat5 cable. The shielded cable, truthfully, not gonna do a whole lot for you in this scenario. Or create more problems for you. It, it can. So in this scenario, using this, Cat5 should be fine. Cat6 should be fine as well. Also, I'm not a big fan of shielding in cables. It can create its own problems. When you get reflected signals inside, it can actually cause multi-path problems. I'm not a fan of it. There are people, other companies, that use the shield for part of the drain or power feed. I'd rather not do that. Right. So, uh, Greg, again, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, next, we have Richard. Richard is asking a very similar question. Do we recommend cat cable, and is there any advantage or disadvantage to use shielded? Kind well, of mashes those two questions we together. We pretty much so. already answered that, but... When possible, run Cat6. Higher bandwidth is always good. I don't encourage shielded. 
because again, it does create its own problems. And most guys, it's hard to properly terminate. It really is. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you use a UTP, you're better off. Right. Now, uh, and another point to talk about on this, which we'll do a whole video about this on our live webinar at some point. It, I, I need to tell you about it, actually, eventually. Um, but uh, we'll be talking about the, the best way to really terminate and run wires for these extenders. Um, number one, try not to use patch cable or patch connections, um, punch down, either in a keystone or in a punch down uh, uh, tray of some sort. But, um, but we'll, talk, we'll, we'll do a whole video on, on that uh, idea later on. So for now, um, just straight run cable. UTP. A good Cat6 cable, you know, ours of course. Uh, and a good RJ45 Cat6 termination on the end of it Ours, of course. is going to make a great, great connection. Um, like I said, here for the actual live demo, it was a Cat5 cable, and it, you saw the, on the screen, it worked really well. Um, so, on to our final, uh, final question from uh, uh, Bruce. Bruce is asking, does this pass HDR and Dolby Vision? Does this? This absolutely passes HDR. Dolby Vision is an issue with the Valence chip in general. Um, they did introduce, uh, announced the introduction of a new chip. Mm -hmm. However, we're probably, honestly, two years away from seeing that chip. We don't know. Right. But Valens is working on finding a way to support Dolby Vision. Right now, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. none of them do. If you want to support Dolby Vision, you need to do it with a cable connection, an AOC, a fiber, or a passive or active copper cable, not right. an extender. Right. So. Uh, after all of those questions, I do believe we have a winner. Do you uh, do we um, have a winner? I think we do. So, and who do you think it is? So honestly, at this point, the one uh, that I'm I'm kind of leaning more towards uh, is when will the 2.1 cables be available uh, from Symphony Hi-Fi? So Symphony Hi-Fi, we'll be in touch with you. And this will be yours. More importantly, be in touch with us so it's not Symphony Hi-Fi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys, so much. And uh, we look forward to, to talking to you again on the next live show. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, we, you, YouTube, uh, YouTube um, wherever we're at, basically. You can find us on that. Now, I'm an old man, so I don't know all these things, but I'm told they're important, so please do. I've been Adam. This has been Brent. We're out of here. We'll, we'll see you soon.